So when we think of might, power, strength, and dominion, and, and dominion, here are some of the images that probably come to mind. Keep them going, Brian. <laughs> He's the man who started it all. Had to, had to give a quick tribute to Arnie. But when God... You can take that picture off. <laughs> when God... When God wants you to see what He thinks... What picture comes to his mind when he uh, conceives of the words might, power, strength, and dom dominion or domination? His, his perspective, his mindset is way different than ours. Instead, your mighty God looks like this. And, and this. listen to this story that I found from a guy named Roger Thompson. He wrote a book, Treasure in a Brown Bag. He said, when I was in high school, I worked for Brinks Armored Car Company in San Bernardino, California. My job was to take care of the coins. We would get 40 tons of coins from Las Vegas alone. I could wrap about $10,000 worth of quarters in an hour. $1,000 is about an 80-pound bag. One day, we got a call from Bank of America with a desperate need for quarters. All the trucks were out. So Larry, my manager, brought his 49 Ford pickup around to the bay. We loaded up $25,000 worth of quarters. You do the math. $25,000, 80-pound bags, 2,000 pounds, one ton. That 49 Ford was dragging. We pulled up to the Bank of America, and Larry said, Wait here. I'm going inside to get a dolly to carry the, the money inside. I waited by the truck, very nervous. The treasure people were walking by, but they didn't see it because of the commonness of the delivery system. This infant in a feeding trough is God's greatest treasure. And most people did not recognize that treasure because of God's chosen delivery system. This helpless infant is called Mighty God in Isaiah 9.6. Now, I don't normally do this, but I think it's pretty instructive. There are two Hebrew words that are joined together here. One is El. El is, is a name for God that's used throughout. It's probably the most common name for God used throughout the Old Testament. And it, it literally could be translated the strong one because El uh, typifies strength. Now, the second word, an adjective, is added to describe God. And this word is Gabor. Now, Gabor was used of mighty men, people of renown, heroes, manliness, champions, warriors. Now, these same two words are, t are taken and put in reverse order to, to uh, name one of God's mightiest angels, Gabriel. This helpless infant is El Gabor. He is mighty God. Now, mighty God is not simply a title. Mighty God is who he is. It's how he he behaves. Deuteronomy 10.21 reads this way. For the Lord your God is God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who is not partial and does not and takes no bribes. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. And nothing and no one can influence him away from what he knows is right. From the direction and the path he will always take. He is God. There is none other period, end of discussion. That is who was lying in that manger. Not the picture
picture of might, power, strength, and the domination that we normally think of. Now, when I look at a baby, and, and I, I in my role as pastor, I get to dedicate babies. I get to go to the hospital with a lot of people and see brand new babies. I, I love doing that, but every time I look at a baby, I am never prompted to think or to say, wow, what a powerful leader. It never dawns on me to, 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 to think of the conquering king that this child is or to call that child a mighty warrior because helpless, frail, tiny, weak infants do not inspire fear or command authority. But this infant, lying in a feeding trough, we are told, is mighty God. God chose to display his might in the frail frame of an infant. Let's not miss the, the point there. True might would not be expressed in a way that men expect, men who long for domination, power, strength, and might. Paul made this point very simply said this in 2 Corinthians 10. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. The people, the people of Israel expected this king that would come, would come and vanquish Rome, would reestablish Israel as the capital of the world. They thought he would come and he would defeat all their foes. He would destroy all their enemies. But they didn't know who the enemy was. They were looking in the wrong direction. And, and in a study of, of, of illusion, helping bringing in the truth while they were looking in, in this direction, while they were looking in another direction, God truly did defeat all the enemies that all mankind are faced with. His mighty self in flesh and bone and put himself on display in the manger. This is what Paul says. This is from the, the message paraphrase of the Bible. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the street. Over the last month, maybe two, Connie and I have had just a, something that doesn't usually happen happening to, uh, in our in our lives. There's a, a young lady who used to be part of our youth group, um, and she uh, caught up with me on Facebook, and we've been um, having contact with one another. Um, she's been calling, and, and uh, in one of the conversations, all of a sudden her voice changed. And it was just really a an odd experience to be speaking to uh, a demon. And and as as we carried on just a short little conversation, the thing that I ended up doing was saying, "You have no authority. You're a vanquished enemy. You just aren't willing to admit it. You have to leave." The Bible says, "If we resist the devil, he has to flee from us." And as I sang scripture to him, and as, as I, I quoted scripture to him, eventually he had to leave. Now, that is the enemy we have. He is real. And we need to understand that when Jesus came, he defeated this enemy. He is done. He is finished. He has no power and no authority. And any power that he has is power that has been granted to him by your father and mine. The whys and wherefores of all that, I don't pretend to understand. But I know that nothing comes into your life or mine that does not first pass through the hands of our gracious and loving Father. He is Lord of Lords. He is King of Kings. He is mighty and no matter what is happening in our lives, whether we are rich or poor, sick or healthy, 
whether our finances are doing great or not so good, He is mighty God. And He is King of kings, and He is Lord of lords. And when Jesus came in the manger, and then when He hung on the cross, He defeated six enemies. This mighty God went to battle for you, the mighty warrior Jesus went to battle for you and me and defeated six of our enemies. The first enemy that he defeated, he defeated our need to be perfect. When the law came, the law set this standard. Very simple, right? Ten simple rules. No big deal, right? I got ten fingers, I can look at them, I can count. Ten laws, not a big thing. But the thing about the law was the law did not allow me to become perfect. The law made me feel like I needed to be perfect. And so we go through our lives feeling like we never never measure up, like we'll never be good enough. And the thing is, the reason we feel that way is because we won't. We aren't. We can't be. The law was brought so that we would understand that we are weak and frail and without God, we will not become perfect. Romans 3.20 says this, For by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. If you, if someone asks you the question, if you were to die right now and you were to stand before God and he would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? Why should I let you into my kingdom? If your answer is, I was good enough, then God is going to say, eh. no, but thank you for playing. <laughs> you can never be good enough. Now, you might be better than me, but you will never be better than the law. God's standard of perfect holiness. But Jesus defeated your need to be perfect. Romans 3 says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh but walk according to the spirit. You see what he's saying there? He's saying the righteous need demand of the law is fulfilled in you when you trust Jesus by faith and walk in the spirit. Not when you do your best, live a good life, do all the right things because if that's what you're relying on, you will be lost forever. Jesus defeated your need to be perfect. Now, when the law came, it, it brought to light a problem that every daughter of Eve and every son of Adam has. Sin. So what did Jesus do? He not only defeated our need to be perfect, he also defeated sin. Completely obliterated sin. You do not have to sin. Now, as long as you're in the flesh, you're going to struggle with sin. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you or I are ever going to be perfect while we're here on the earth. That is, we never, ever sin. But sin is not our boss. It's like the little kid you know, who says to his little brother or sister, you're not the boss of me. Sin is not the boss of you. You don't have to do what it says. 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter 2 says this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were like uh, were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. He defeated sin. He also defeated death. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be in heaven, but I'm kind of scared to die. Because I've never done that before. And I don't know what it's going to be like. Right? It's okay. 
And frankly, death was not ever part of God's initial plan. Death is, is something that is completely foreign to what God's desire for you and me is or ever would be. Death came on us because of our sin. And so even though we sinned, even though we turned our backs on God and, and rejected Him, He paid for your sin and He vanquished the enemy, death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says. And then, a few verses later in the same chapter, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. It's already been vanquished. And the power of sin is the law. The law has now been fulfilled in Jesus. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He defeated our need to be perfect. He defeated sin. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He is a vanquished enemy who does not realize it, does not want to believe it, and will do everything he can so that you think that he has power and authority in your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, God said, back in the garden. And between your offspring and her offspring, he will, get this, crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He is a vanquished, crushed, defeated enemy. That is one of the things Jesus meant when he hung on the cross, and right before he breathed his last breath, and he said, it is finished. Paid for. Done. He also then defeated the grave. This is one of my favorite passages. And regarding the question, friends, this is from, again, the message paraphrase. Uh, regarding the question, friends, that has come up about what happens to those already dead and buried, we don't want you to be in the dark, to be in the dark any longer. First off, you must not carry on over, though, over them like people who have nothing to look forward to, as if the grave were the last word. Since Jesus died and broke loose the, from the grave, God will most certainly bring back to life those who died in Jesus. He has defeated the grave. Finally, he's defeated hell. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Now, as I was thinking about this, I thought it'd be kind of cool if there were just five of them. Because then Jesus would be giving him the knockout punch, right? That's our mighty God. But there's six. So I think he gave him a poke in the eye first. And then he gave him the knockout punch. And, and we should rejoice in that. You know what? This life, there's going to be hard things in this world. Jesus said, you're going to have trials in this world, but take heart, I've overcome it. He's defeated all of our enemies. There's not an enemy that you have that he has not defeated, that he is not Lord of Lords over, King of Kings, that he's not mighty God over. Now that doesn't mean that you command these things and they happen. He's still God. But you can know that even if God for some reason gives that enemy some authority in your life for a time, he will never have you. Never. You are owned by a mighty God who gave everything for you so that you and I could walk in victory. Now, I found this devotional online, and I, I would give credit, but I, I don't know who wrote it. And all it is is scripture strung together with a commentary in the middle. So listen to this. All things in heaven and on earth were created by him, and in him all things hold together. The wind and the waves obey his command. People marveled at the authority of his word. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There is no one greater. He, is, he has no equal. He is eternal God who was and is and is to come. Jesus stands above time and space, the all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-glorious Lord, who being in very nature God made himself nothing by taking the 
very nature of a servant being made in human likeness for us and our salvation, God in Jesus entered the world as a helpless baby. That is our mighty God. And nothing is too difficult for him. So when the angels appeared to the shepherds, interrupting their uneventful evening, watching over their sheep, he said these words, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And they went from there proclaiming that Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, the Promised King, is Lord of Lords. The child in the manger is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Mighty God. Last week, we, in as we were beginning our this series in Isaiah 9-6, we saw that He's a wonderful counselor. And we said that that, that that means that He's a doer of miracles, of marvelous and wonderful things, which are beyond human ability and understanding. And he never makes a bad decision. He always guides us correctly. Jesus can do anything. Nothing is too hard for him. And what he does is always right. And now that we see that he has strength to accomplish whatever he decides to do, nothing and no one will thwart our brings to mind the words of a kid's song. We actually sang this not too long ago. Our God is so great, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Our God is so great, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. The mountains are His, the rivers are His, the stars are His hand. My God is so great, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. You believe that? It's a cat, well, two of you believe it. Do you believe it? You know, I'll just, uh, this is no, no extra charge for this. I know that as I look at myself and I look at here that our, that our skin tone is rather pale. But it's okay to react. It's okay to, you know, say amen or, or even to, you know, say preach it or, or whatever. It's okay. Um, so, uh, I'm, it was probably worth every penny, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, I love you too. <clears throat> well, John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, died last Thursday at the age of 95. Now, Glenn told the world during his 1998 shuttle mission when he was 77. Do you remember that? This guy was 77 years old and they let him go on the shuttle. Listen to what he said. To look up at this kind of creation and not believe in God is impossible to me. It just strengthens my faith. And he spent his life talking about the greatness of God, sharing with anyone who would listen, every public forum privately. So when we think about God being mighty God, Jesus being mighty God, God himself wrapped in flesh and bone, let me kind of drive this home to where we live. Two major things I want to ask you to consider. What issues are facing the world that most concern you? Think about what they might be. What issues are facing the world that most concern you? Terrorist attacks like the one we prayed about? The global economy teetering? The rise of other superpowers that don't really like us? What are those issues that the world is facing that most concern you? Your God is so great, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing your God cannot do. If you doubt it, look around. God made everything that you see. He made every person in this room. He made the mountains that we enjoy and ski on and hike in, ride our snowmobiles on, and do our snowshoeing on. He made those. He made the rivers. He owns them all told us in Psalm 50 that if he had need, he wouldn't tell us because he owns everything. 
What issues keep you personally up at night? Maybe not a global issue, but something that's really impacting you. Look to the manger, and you will see God himself humbled, covered in flesh and bone. struggle with that he is not familiar with, that he cannot help you with. There is nothing that you cannot handle when God is in charge and he is mighty God in your life. Louis Giglio, I just like saying that last name, Giglio. Anyway, Louis Giglio is a pastor of Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He kind of helped me draw what I think this this passage is all about when it talks about him being mighty God to a really fine point when he said this I am not but I know I am let that sink in I am not but I know I am what happens when we live as though nothing is too hard for God let's take a look Sixteen yeah. in the Bible. Can you tell the people about the uncanny coincidence that happened in a press conference a few years later? Yeah, well, we were playing for the national championship um, in college on January 8, 2009, and I decided to wear John 3.16 under my eyes, and during the game, uh, 94 million people Googled John 3.16, and it was a pretty cool moment. Well, exactly three years later, we happened to be playing the Pittsburgh Steelers in the first round of the playoffs when I was with the Denver Broncos, and I didn't even know that it was exactly three years later. It was uh, January 12, or January 8, 2012, exactly three years later to the day. I just went out there and tried to do whatever I could to win a playoff game. And afterwards, I'm going into the press conference because I love talking to the media. <laughs> and uh, our PR guy jumps in front of me and says, Timmy, do you realize what happened? I was like, yeah, we just beat the Steelers. We're going to play the Patriots. And he was like, no, do you realize what happened? I was like, all right, Patrick, what's up? He said, it's exactly three years later from the day that you wore John 316 in your eyes. I was like, oh, that's really cool. He said, no, I don't think you realize what happened. During the game, you threw for 316 yards. Your yards per rush were 3.16. Your yards per completion were 31.6. The ratings for the game were 31.6. And the time of possession was 31.6. And during the game, 90 million people had already Googled John 316. And it was the number one trending thing on Facebook and Twitter. And a lot of people will say, it's coincidence. I say, big God. Let's give God a hand. Coincidence? Big God. I promise you that when you leave this place today, something is going to come into your life that may be big, but it's not too big for God. He can handle it. I am not, but I know I am. Do you know I am? So I have a couple of potential applications for you, as for all of us. Last week, I challenged everyone to consider writing a letter to Jesus. And last week, the, the question we began with and, and ended with was, Jesus, what do you want to renew in my life today? And that's what the letter was supposed to be about. So if you did that, I hope you put it in the basket out there. In six months, I'm going to mail it back to you. I, I'll tell you that it was a really great exercise for me to do. Because there's some things that, that God's putting his finger on in my life. And if you didn't do that and you want to still do that, you can write your letter this week and, and we'll, we'll have the basket out there. The reason I bring that up is because this week, if you wanted to write a letter to God and you would bring to him the issue that you're struggling with, Maybe it's a global issue. Maybe it's a personal issue. If you will bring it to him in this letter and surrender it to him, let him be mighty God and let him do whatever he needs to do, whether he needs to change the situation or he needs to change you. You can write that letter. And the 
the basket will be out there and I'll mail it to you in six months. Other thing you can do, and everyone can do this. As you go throughout the week, I want you to try to remember this phrase. I am not, but I know I am. Let's say that together. I am not, but I know I am. I am not, but I know I am. And whenever a situation confronts you this week, you can say it out loud, you can say it in your head, however you want to. I am not, but I know I am. I'm not in control of this. I'm not able to do anything about this. I don't have the resources to handle this, but I know I am. I know who does. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and your goodness to us. Thank you for allowing yourself to be humiliated in becoming a human, allowing your divine power to be wrapped up in flesh and bone. Thank you that you are mighty God. And there's not a thing in this world that we cannot handle when you're in charge. And there's not an issue in our personal life